Okay, and welcome back to the channel where we live life out loud with purpose. Now, today we're going to talk about a subject that um, I don't think a lot of us like to talk about. But, you know, that's one of the things that we're here to do. We're here to shed light in otherwise dark places, you know, that, you know, we don't like to deal with on an everyday basis, but I think are necessary things that we have to deal with. So, and death is one of those things. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. It's not what I want to talk about, but it's what I'm going to talk about. And remember, um, I'm all about change. I'm all about uh, real change. And in order to have real change, we have to learn our truth and then stand in that truth. Okay? So, with that being said, um, death. Uh, yeah, I had a death in my family recently. You know, uh, I had a brother that passed away in the past year. And, you know, a lot of us didn't deal with it well. A lot of people dealt with it okay. Um, me, um, I had up and down moments, you know. For the most part, I was good. Because I think a lot of us deal with death. We deal with it from a place of guilt. And because we haven't learned to manage our emotions properly, we mismanage our emotions. By the way, look for up and coming videos soon called Mismanaging Your Emotions. All right, look for that video. So anyways, um, we mismanage our emotions and we don't tend to use them properly during the grieving process. And most people grieve from a place of guilt. And what I mean by that, um, they, they feel guilty inside. They're real sad. And it's usually because, you know, it's the woulda, coulda, shoulda things. You know, uh, I should have called or... You know, I should have stopped by when they when they asked me to. You know, I wish I would have stopped when I when I had the chance. And if I only could have another chance, I would do these things. You know, the woulda, shoulda, coulda things. And and then we then we feel guilty inside because we don't have an answer to the woulda, coulda, shouldas. You know, but if you tend to take care of those while people are alive then you don't have those moments. You don't have those bad grieving moments. You know, of course, I think we're miss people because, you know, it's just natural, you know, and there's a void when you're used to seeing people or used to hearing people or expecting people to be there at a certain time or a certain place and they're not there. There's a void. And the human heart, you know, wants to fill that void. You know, and, you know, because we mismanage our emotions, we usually fill it with the wrong thing when we experience death. And I'm going to say it very specifically, death. I'm not going to say loss. Because it always behooves me when people say, um, I'm sorry for your loss. When a loved one has died, um... Well, they weren't keys. So I ain't looking. When you look at something, you're looking for it. And I'm not looking for my loved one in the couch, down in the cushions. You know, I'm, I'm not looking for them, you know, up underneath the table or behind the bed. You know, I haven't lost them. You know, and those of us who know who we are. And we have an identity with who we are, where we come from. We know that source. We're in relationship with the source. We know that our loved ones belong to that source. 
And we'll again be connected to that source. So we'll see our loved ones again. We'll commune with them again. You know, maybe not in the capacity that we do it with now. Here on the runway. I call this the runway. You know, and depending on uh, how you take off on the runway. Will depend on where you accelerate to. So you could accelerate above and beyond into the next heavens or you can crash and burn but I'm going to tell you the alternative to going to where I'm going to is not pleasing see one of the things I know and this I know without a doubt folks there's nothing that nobody or nothing could ever convince me of otherwise I'm going to heaven without a doubt I'm going to heaven. What I'm doing on what I'm doing right here on earth is I'm working on my real estate. See, the thing is, is I don't, I'm not just gonna make it to heaven. I'm not gonna be one of those people that just got there. And, you know, I'm the gates by. I got the gate right up against my back. You know, I'm like, whoo! I'm glad I made it. No, my place in heaven is gonna be way up there. My place in heaven is gonna be where. You know, if you if you back at that gate, you ain't going to be able to make me out. I'm just going to blend in with the horizon. That's how far my place in heaven is going to be. I'm going to be right next door to Jesus and Moses. They're going to be my neighbors. That's my place in heaven. I don't know about you. I don't know where you're going. I can't speak or contest to that. But for me... I know where I'm going and know where I belong. So, with that being said, again, we're going to get back to our subject. And again, we're talking about death. And like I said, guilt. Guilt. A lot of people approach death or deal with death from a guilty standpoint. You know, um, because they haven't done the phone calls. They didn't stop. They didn't pick up, you know, and, and, and stop by when they called. You know, or just made time for people, you know, simple time that, you know, we could have made. And then when we don't make it, when those people are in here, now we feel guilty because we don't have, we don't have that time that we could have spent with them. And that's where I said, again, the woulda, coulda, shouldas come in. And when we deal with death from that perspective, it's always going to make you feel really bad. But when you're good with people, when you had made the phone calls and you did stop by and you know you did everything right by them, if they leave this place on earth, again, naturally, the natural human body, the sense is going to say you miss them, but you're not guilty that they died. And I think that's where um, the perspective comes from, where I think a lot of people feel guilty, where people feel like they, they haven't done right by that person. You know, and I think that's where all the tears and with all the anguish and all the um, turmoil comes from now I, I'm a parent I've lost a child I've lost a sibling and I've lost a parent and a grand and grandparents aunts uncles cousins friends yeah I know death but you know, I don't take it personal. You know, I don't, I know that death isn't just coming to mess with me or mess with my people. You know, death comes for all of us. It's going to come. It's going to happen, you know, um, depending on our life and how we live our life here on the runway. Again, if we're on the runway. Uh, depending on how we 
take off on this runway um, will depend on, you know, um, where we're going to wind up in the afterlife, you know. Again, I think that we all tend to deal with death differently, you know, and, and I, I'm not by no means saying that there's a blueprint for how you cope with uh, death. I don't, I, I know there's not a blueprint for it. And, you know, again, we all deal with it differently. You know, um, I'm reminded of a story. Um, I read it a long time ago. Uh, I can't remember where I read it. So hopefully somebody out there maybe have also read the story and can um, get back to me and let me know where I read it. I'd love to go back and reread it again. You know, amongst the millions of things that I've read among, uh, all throughout the years. But anyway, story goes, uh, there's a young lady. Her name is Katami. That's the way I want to remember I pronounced it then, Katami. And um, this was a Buddhist book, so um, and she was from an Indian village and the name Katami was to mean lazy and um, I remember the story goes she was very pretty but very lazy um, because she was pretty she was spoiled youngest growing up they spoiled her really wasn't meant to do anything fell in love with a rich ruler um, he fell in love with her beauty, um, married her, but her, his family despised her. They despised her because she was so lazy and just didn't do anything. And all she wanted to do was lay around and he just wanted to cater to her every whim. So, um, she became pregnant and she had a child, a man child. Now, this was the ultimate thing within a family. She produced a man child so the family looked at her in a different aspect you know now they catered to her every whim just like her husband did but one morning she went to go get her son up and her son didn't wake up and she freaks out like oh my god he's not waking up he's not waking up what am I gonna do what am I gonna do you know why is this happening to me he's not waking up and all she can think about is how the family's going to treat her bad again. They're not going to love her anymore. You know, maybe even her husband might not even love her now. You know, she lost, he lost her, her man child. His, his man child is, is, is dead. Is it waking up? The story goes. So, she's starting to ask everybody, hey, hey, I need medicine. I need medicine. Can somebody give me medicine? to help me wake up my son, he won't wake up. So somebody told her, take your son up to the wise man at the top of the hill. If there's anybody that can help you, the wise man at the top of the hill will, the sage at the top of the hill will be able to help you. So she gathers her son, she takes him up on her hill and she walks him up on the top of this hill, tells her, you know, definitely, there's some medicine he can make that'll make her son all well. He can do it. So she gets excited. She is so excited. So he tells her she needs a mustard seed. But the mustard seed has to come from a house that no one has died at. And if she can find a mustard seed from a house that no one has died, he can make medicine for her. So she got so excited. She she goes to the first house. Hey, hey, excuse me, excuse me. Do you have mustard seed? Do you have mustard seed? They told her, yeah. She said, please, please, can I have some mustard seed? You know, I need it to make my son well. She got the mustard seed. She's ready to go back up the hill. But she remembers what the sage says, that it has to come from a house that no one has ever died at. So she goes to the next house. Mustard seed, mustard seed, do you have mustard seed? And they told her, yes. Yeah. She says, do you, has anyone ever died here? And they told her, yes. So she goes to the next house, has anyone ever died here? 
They told her yes. She carried her son. She goes to the next house. And through this, she makes it to the end of the village. I remind you, you know, her name was Katami, which meant lazy one. Or something to that effect. And um, never liked to do anything. But throughout this whole the tragedy, she's carrying her son on her hip. You know. And she gets to the end of the village and she begins to weep and she starts to dig a hole and she buries her son and begins to pray. And in her prayer, she begins to apologize to her son for carrying him so long. And, you know, she realized that she took his death personal, that it's what happened to me. Look at what happened to me. Look at what you did to me. You know, and I think we all get to that place sometimes when we're going through tragedy such as death. You know, look at what happened to me. This has only happened to me. You know, look at what you did to me. You know, not realizing that, you know, death happens to everyone. And it's not something that we should take personal. Again, you know, we all are going to miss our loved ones because of voids. But death can be a place where we can learn from as well. Where we can build from as well. And what I mean by that is, you know, out of that guilt, when you realize you didn't have the best relationships, with that person, then, you know, maybe now you can fix the relationships you do have with the people that are here on earth now. You know, you can make the phone calls that you don't otherwise make. You can stop by, you can go out of the way and go the extra couple of blocks to stop by and say hi to somebody. You know what I'm saying? So that when those days do come because they will come. You don't have to experience it through guilt, you know? And I'm just saying that to, as a way that we can grow and we can have freedom in death. You know, there can be freedom. You know, we don't have to live in guilt and live, um, compelled to feel guilty every day and live in condemnation of guilt, you know, when we can do something right now about the relationships we do have, you know, so again, this is Trent and I'm saying live life out loud with purpose. We'll see you soon.